I remember when I first came on the board, my first job was to fire the assistant superintendent, oh. um, young fellow. Names escape me right now. Go ahead and start recording. <laughs> uh, anyways, the, the story is that um, years ago, we always wanted a, a, a swimming pool. And for many reasons, they couldn't put it over here, uh, mainly because they didn't want to. But finally, uh, they decided they were going to put a, a pool over here at Rogers Park. And so they came to Goshen Rotary and said, would you sponsor the fundraising for this? And um, so we started right off with the Rotarians, how many will give, how much will you give, and so on. And one of the R Rotarians gave stock to the company that he owned. and. Uh, is there still may be people alive that this would reflect on, so I'm not going to tell you the name of the company and okay. so on like that, okay? Uh, but anyways, he gave stock, and, uh, and it was a success. We built the pool, everything worked out, and uh, there was an agreement with the city that uh, we could make up to so much money, and then uh, after that, we could keep the money, but up to, I think it was $2,000 we had to give to the city. Okay, everything went along fine, and a uh, period of time, I'm, I'm guessing maybe eight to ten years, the liner in the pool uh, needed to be replaced and repaired and so on. So it came to Rotary again, would you raise the funds for it? And uh, there were some in Rotary that didn't think maybe it was necessary that they should be involved in it again, and some things like that. It wasn't quite as acceptable as it was the first time. But I got a telephone call from a fellow, and he said, you know, he said, I gave stock. And uh, he said, as far as I know, that stock was never cashed in. And I said, oh, that, that's interesting. <laughs> and, uh, so we began to hunt to find out where the stock was. Oh, and there was a safe that was over here in the little building. And uh, no one knew the combination to the safe. <laughs> <laughs> over at the park office. At the park office. At the park office. Big, okay. big park old office. safe setting over there in the corner that various superintendents had inherited as they came along, but never had an occasion to get into, sure. especially since they didn't know the combination. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so finally, we traced down the combination uh, from the gentleman that was a superintendent way back in there. And we got it, and we opened it up, and sure enough, there was a stock. There's no stock. <laughs> the stock was in there. And had done very well, by the way. Oh. <laughs> it, it had appreciated, so uh, no, there was no, uh, no one was really unhappy that it hadn't been found sooner because we did all right on it after it was discovered. <laughs> but that, that was a discovery. That was the story of the safe. What else was in there? I have no idea. Amazing. And that happened while Sherry was here? No. Oh, no, okay. that was quite some time before yeah. Sherry arrived. Okay. Uh, I was trying to think of the superintendent. The, Rich Fay. Rich Fay. Okay. There you go. Okay. Rich Fay was the superintendent uh, that came uh, he was the first superintendent that came after the gentleman who had been superintendent for many years, but this young fellow who was his assistant had kind of taken it over, and uh, everyone sort of felt that he was going to take over the park department when the other fellow retired. Uh, but it didn't work out that way. Uh, he and Rich weren't able to see it in yeah. the same progressive light. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that didn't work out. Uh, and then Rich moved on to, I think, the state of Washington, became active out there. Yeah. And Sherry and a man from Carmel, Indiana, were interviewed, uh, and, uh, and we sort of decided, uh, you know, we had to choose between the two of them. And, and uh, I sort of leaned towards the man from Carmel, who ever heard of a lady uh, being superintendent of the parks, you know, back in those days, I, I was just like the rest of the mass. You know? <laughs> but uh, fortunately, that fellow dropped out of the competition, and Sherry took over, and she was fantastic at working out um, programs with, like the hospital, mm -hmm. and they would sponsor the building the trail, and then they would have a health program, and uh, this youth. 
Olympics program that she got started. Yeah, she yeah. she just constantly we would say, oh boy, that's a great idea. How are we going to find? Oh, I already have somebody who's going to help us out, you know, funding wise. She was fantastic, and as you know, I'm sure laid a good foundation for you to she pick did. it up. She yeah. laid a great foundation, yeah. yeah, for all of us. That's for sure. Well, I tell you, I was very very pleased to come back and see all the new parks, yeah. hey parks, and, yeah. and of course they had new names. They were, some of the parks were named after the mayors and so on mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So, Larry, anyway, would, would, you, would you take some time to uh, look over this map and kind of tell us about your stomping grounds as you were growing yeah, up? Sure would. Um, and just, just kind of tell us about different places that you see here, what's different, what's the same? Well, I was very fortunate. I, I, uh, in 1944, we moved down here. Uh, let's see, that would be the home I grew up in, 1211 Wilson Avenue. Uh, and of course there weren't, well, let's see, the Murrays, there were some homes on Murray Street. Uh, but it was very easy for me to get walk out of my house. This was all orchard. Mom and Dad had a big orchard. Mm. And I'd go down here and cross the bridge, the Murray Street Bridge, and I had all of this area to run in as a, as a young boy. Um, to, uh, we built rafts in, in the river and so on. And at this time, this portion of the river was very active. Okay. And this area was just a little stream that would only run when we had floods. Right, okay. But over the years, with a few log jams ending yep. up in here, this began to open up. It's shifted now, right? Right. Now this is this is when we this is the floodway and this is the main course. That's exactly right. And that I didn't realize that that could happen in a lifetime. Yeah. You know, I thought it would take many, many more years than that. But I caught a lot of uh, red eyes, rock bass and smallmouth bass in there because mm. my brother and I fished this all the time and hunted rabbits in it. And of course, we could we could find a tree that was down on cross and mm. go out into the Nefsco area. Yeah. And uh, right. And th this was already owned by Nefsco. Uh, Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They were they were making this right right along in here. There was a real deep ditch. And when the river would oh. flood, it would run back into that ditch and flood this area out here. And that's where okay. I went through the ice. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the river had come up in December and flooded. And of course that chased all the rabbits and so on up on these little high hills. And so I'd take my old red bone hound and we'd go back here and we'd go hunting. And I decided to take a shortcut and go out to Plymouth Avenue and walk home that way. And uh, I went through the ice in that ditch. and. Uh, it was quite an experience. Right in over your head, right? Oh yeah, and there was, yeah. you know, there was at least that much area because the river had gone down, okay. was flowing the, into the river, the flood. So there, there was a gap, uh, uh, an yeah. air gap. Yeah, um, and I went down and, and I was able to kick myself back up and get some air. <laughs> oh, that, I'll never forget how that bad that smelled. But uh, I kept kicking and pushing forward because the current had carried me down. Yeah, right. Finally, I spied the uh, opening and I still had my gun. And I was able to get my little 410 shotgun across the hole and then get myself oh, up and, up. and spread eagle. And I finally got over to the highway yeah, and uh, I'm sure I looked like a ice man because I start freezing right away yeah. and all that. And where the uh, where the park department's house, the little place is, mm -hmm. that was owned by a German fellow who was a World War II veteran, and uh, he was in the in the Corps uh, First Aid you know, Red Cross or huh. something like that. Anyways, he saw me coming. It was all snowy, yeah. and I was running down here. I was hoping I could get a car to stop. Yeah. But they just slowed down the young man with a gun. They kept going, you know. <laughs> and uh, so finally, it, it, he saw me, oh, as I came into the lane, and uh, it was just less than a few minutes, and I was buck naked in a tub of water. Yeah. He had my hands and my feet in there, as he thought I'd, I'd get frostbite. Yeah. And I was really, really scared that my father would take the gun away from me. I'd gotten it for Christmas. 
I was about 12, 13 years old. And I thought that he would think I was pretty irresponsible. He'd take the gun away from me, so I called my brother. And my brother, all he knew was that I had gone through the ice, so here he came 50 miles an hour with a ladder strapped on top of his truck because oh. <laughs> he thought I might still be out there. And, uh, but my dog was still back at the hole. She, she just stayed there and kept guard on that. So everybody was happy ever after, and Dad didn't find out about it till <laughs> some, some time later. Yeah. But yeah, this was all my stomping grounds. And this area, of course, was the Hoke Farm. They had a, this was the old farmhouse, so the living room of that house is a log cabin. Okay. Big, thick window sills. And uh, they had a, an old greenhouse out in here. And they, they started plants for everybody. Everybody got their tomato plants mm. and those things. Oh, wow. And they had a pretty good business because there's, I think, six or seven different types of soil in this area, yeah. from Muck okay. to mm -hmm. Oshimo, I think it's called. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, they raised all kinds of vegetables and supplied all the stores, but then the Kalamazoo greenhouses came in oh. and put them out of business. They it's had, business. you know, they had, uh, they could raise things cheaper and they could do it all year long and so on yeah. like that. Yeah. But then the place came up for sale Oh, I graduated from dental school in 59, and I believe the farm came up for sale in like 60, 61, something like that. Okay, okay. And uh, we just knew, I just knew, I really wanted that place. I'd, it's my old tropping grounds, you know. Yeah, right. But it was in deplorable condition, really bad shape. And uh, my wife <clears throat> knew how bad I wanted it, didn't have any money. But uh, her grandmother had decided to uh, give everybody their share of the inheritance, and her father had been killed uh, when he was when she was only 18 months old. So they treated her as one of the boys, and and that amount that we inherited was just enough to make the down payment on the farm. <laughs> so that's that's the story of how we ended up there. And but uh, a lot of time in this. Well, there was an old hermit lived right here on the curve. That was one of the, the people I wanted to ask you about. Yeah, uh, he, all I know is that he was a German and he was kind to the children. Um, uh, and along this this area was always wet, where it mm, dripped yeah. from, leaked through from the canal. Yeah, and that was where woodcock would come in the spring. Okay. It's a really interesting bird with a long bill, and yeah. they needed that soft ground in the spring. And so I would do some hunting along there, and uh, if I got any, I was never a very good shot in, at birds, and if I got any woodcock or anything, I usually would stop and give them to him. Huh. So we, we were kind of good buddies. Now, he moved, he had moved by the time we bought the place up here, but I think if he was the same one, he settled right over in this area okay. here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that was the same man, but boy, I don't know that for a fact. And I never stopped to visit that fellow. I, okay. I didn't spend any time with him or anything. I was older and going to school and okay. so on. So I don't know if that was the same man or not. But the fellow that was here was sure a nice gentleman. And uh, I think Mr. Hoke uh, just allowed him to squat to kind of on that yeah. land. Huh. And uh, he knew a lot of things, uh, herbs and yeah, all that kind of stuff. So he was interesting to talk to. So he was he was a little bit of a, I mean, he was kind of living on the land. Yes. And, as well as maybe handouts or goodwill. Yeah, from how, now how he, well, I think he, he found things and, and uh -huh. sold them and so on. Uh -huh. um, I think he was the first one that I ever talked to about uh, Jensing, oh, Jensing, I okay. think it was. He knew all kinds of herbs and things like yeah. that. He yeah. and he knew all of that stuff. Okay. Really interesting guy. And like I say, he was he was kind to the children. At least he was always kind to me. <laughs> uh, so uh, I enjoyed him. But this was a wonderful place to grow up. Wonderful place to grow up. Had so many good times on that Elkhart River. And. Uh, 
all of this area. Let's see, here we are. This field here. Yeah. Okay. This was all orchard. Okay. And this area here, with this field here, was usually corn. But one year or a couple of years, a fellow planted popcorn in there. And that was right when the automatic um, shellers, the uh, harvesters, were hooked on the front of the tractor and they picked their corn that way yeah. instead of by hand. Okay. But we discovered, my brother and I, that when the machine made a turn, it missed. Uh, maybe a whole row of corn that would corn. knock it down, but the corn would still be on the stalk. So we would come down here at night, because we never knew whether it was legal or not, uh, <laughs> with uh, Boy Scout backpacks, <laughs> and we would walk those rows with our feet, and we would feel the corn down mm -hmm. underneath there. We'd stop down and pick up an ear of corn and throw it mm -hmm. in there. And uh, we had the best popcorn for the whole year. You know? <laughs> we stored that up in uh, mom and dad's attic. And uh, whenever we wanted popcorn up, we'd go and Well, and so who, who was farming this? Was, was that the, the Murray? The Murrays farm? owned it. But by the time I remember these things here, uh, no one was farming it. They were, they were, someone else came in and farmed it. Okay. I think it might have been the Hayes, but I'm not uh -huh. sure about that. Okay. But, but someone else came in and farmed it, and, they, and this field here, they all, there was 11 acres in this mm -hmm. area. Okay. Um, this had already started growing up in the secondary so This is things. pretty low, right? Right. Yeah. That area yeah. there especially, the floods over. Okay. And, uh, and they planted corn. The first pheasant. I ever ever shot in my life came out of a cornfield in that uh, there. in that yeah. area. Um, t tell me a little bit about I mean, the, uh, the Murray Farm was here or, or house anyway. Yes, is that, that's right. Is that right? Okay, came across it up up here on Murray Street. Uh, there was Cecil, and I don't mm. I can't tell you the man's name that lived on the canal, but there were two Murrays. You mentioned a Frank once, and Frank lived down here. Okay, at okay. the end of the lane, and there were there were two houses here at the end of the lane. Frank Murray lived in the in the larger house. Okay. he was an interior decorator, uh, and so his house was was really neat. It, instead of having the ceiling and the walls come together, it was all rounded. He oh, had, wow. he had uh, somehow he Plastic could do that with something. wallpaper or something. He oh, could. It, it was a beautiful home. A lot of uh, gingerbread on it and so on like that. And uh, I got to know him as a as a youngster, but pretty much I uh, got to know him because the rules of, about kids being where his truck patch was and his asparagus grew and things like that. <laughs> we were taught that quite early with Frank. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I knew him, and then when I bought the farm here, he was in his late 60s, early 70s by that time. And I used to go over on weekends, either Saturday or Sunday. He was pretty lonely. I had a lady that would come and take care of his house for him and so yeah. on. Uh, but I would go over and chat with him. And uh, uh, he, he was a wonderful guy. He could tell all kinds of stories. He used to tell a story about a physician that loved to fish for smallmouth bass. And he would make house calls, but he had a very difficult time coming across this. There was an old bridge here at that time huh. that was lower. And he would had difficulty going across there because he always had to stop and fish a while <laughs> before he did. <laughs> and uh, in fact, he used, to, he used to laugh about that because he, he just loved to come and visit patients that lived along the river so he could fish for smallmouth. Yeah. Uh. You always used to start the conversation, Beachy, why am I still here? All my friends are gone, and uh, I don't know why I'm still alive. But after we would talk a while, he would begin to tell me stories. I used to tell him. It was so you'd tell me stories yeah, yeah, when I came yeah, over. Yeah. And, uh, and then he'd cheer up when he began to talk about the stories and so on. At that time, the, the creek that flows into the river now, that, that came behind the houses. That, let's okay. see if I can get my bearings here. here we houses so would be right have up been in, in here. here. Okay. Right? Yeah, the creek came down and then ran behind the houses oh. and ran into the river back in oh, here. That's interesting. And the creek was, it was had a nice gravel bottom, and that's where we used to, 
and that um, crawfish and, uh -huh. and sometimes we'd get minnows out of there, my brother and I, to go fishing um, with. But that, that we were in that so creek a lot. It was so a nice it used clean. To cut along back here instead right. of yeah. straight through as it does now. When they came in and and, uh, and the city bought this and took over the responsibility to keep that creek open, uh, then they just dredged it right out straight to the river. Okay. And okay. Uh, and it eliminated this part here. Okay. But Mr. Salt lived there. there were there were actually two houses but in the one house was like a duplex okay and uh, mr salt was the one that actually did the farming back in the days that they farmed and back so on into here. yeah okay and he evidently was a good friend or worked for mr murray i'm not not quite sure what it was but the salts mr salt and his wife lived in the front part of the house and the back part of the house was a rental property. Uh, there was a boy there by the name of, last name was Miller, Tom Miller, uh, when uh, we used to walk to school together. He'd mm. come over here and, huh. get, and we'd go up here to Parkside. Okay. Was. But yeah, and so Frank had the house on this side of the road and then kind of if the road would have continued, it would have gone into the house where Mr. Salt. Okay. And uh, so, so uh, kind of like an alley. house was kind of here. Yeah. And, and the other house where Mr. Salt lived was here. Right. That's exactly okay. right. And and the barn, there was a barn yet there too. That's right. right. And, and the, when we go out uh, to hike, we can kind of look at the remains of the foundation. Yeah. Um, that barn was still up when when I was a kid. Okay. And. Uh, that was where the uh, most exciting thing in the neighborhood ever happened. That was where yeah. someone by the name of Miller, they were, th this was a dump over here at this time. Okay. And, and just a flood plain in there and everybody dumped their trash and cans and stuff and uh, over on that side. But somehow they had gone down there, uh, Ernest Miller and his girlfriend and the one that didn't belong uh, somehow or other. I don't know if they had started going together during the war and he was gone or what, but you know, that was right during the war years. Okay. And, and uh, so he shot this fella and, uh, and then jumped out of the car and ran down in here somewhere. And the state police came and the Goshen police came and they searched and searched and we never could find, he, they couldn't find Ernie Miller but all of us kids knew he was just hiding back here or any place. And for a while, our parents wouldn't let us go down there. We absolutely right. couldn't go down there. But then it wasn't long till we were sneaking down there and we would holler back, hurry. You know, we thought that was neat. <laughs> and uh, uh, then the chief of police lived up on Main Street. And by that time uh, in this area here, you could rent space and have a garden if you wanted, they would give you, give you a piece of land. Okay. And he had a garden kind of almost below the barn over here in the orchard park. The chief of police. The did. chief of police, yeah. Uh, Hummel was his name. Okay. Uh, and uh, when he was down there working his garden, he got a particular odor that was bad. And so he started walking through the brush back here behind the barn. And sure enough, there Ernie had committed suicide. And they found him. And uh, of course, there the ambulances and yeah. all this kind of stuff came down there, and as they crossed the bridge, all of us kids were right behind. And, <laughs> and I remember climbing up on a fence post behind the uh, barn, and uh, I suppose it was Yoder Kopp. Someone with a rubber bag was there, and they were they had sticks, and they were trying to get this fellow in the bag, and they finally got him in, and they zipped it up. Well, Ruger Morris had set in already. Bang, that arm went back and hit that. I all jumped back. I jumped off that post and ran home as fast as I could get home. Oh my God. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll always remember that arm. Whack, hit that rubber bag and away I went. That was oh. scary. But that was probably the most exciting thing that happened. We did have a boy who, who almost drowned. We used to always, we'd jump in here and we'd swim down to the Tilly property, which 
Let's see, this would have been the Hansons. Tilly's would have been right in here. Okay. And we would swim from there down, and we had a little boat that someone made out of uh, lumber, and we would hang on to that boat and turn it over and have lots of fun. And this fellow wasn't as good a swimmer as, as we thought he was, or uh, anyways, we all arrived and we were pulling the boat up on shore and we realized that uh, Keith Swihart, it was, he's passed away now, uh, wasn't there. Oh. And he was, came floating down. So, Ooh. But we had uh, Sprouts Baker and some of the other boys that were good boy scouts and they gave him artificial respiration oh, and, yeah, wow. and called the ambulance right away. And um, he and lived. Revived him. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. He, he That's incredible. Became quarterback for the Goshen football team. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. But if you really had courage, you climbed up on top of that bridge, and uh, <laughs> and you jumped off. <laughs> and that that was our plane spotting during World War II. We would climb up on top of the bridge, lay there and we would see all kinds of Japanese planes and German planes flying over. Uh -huh. We had a big, that we got from Wheaties box top, a big silhouette of all the enemy planes. Oh, okay. And boy, they were flying over, yeah. so we'd see a lot of them every day. Yeah, right. <laughs> they're, they're looking for Goshen. They're yeah, looking for yeah Goshen. that's right, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, <laughs> so it brought, back, it brought back a lot of memories. Oh, and, wow. Uh, Wow. A lot of activity mm -hmm. around that bridge. Had a lot of fun. Right, right. But this was, this was all orchard. Okay. Uh, there was enough open spots in the orchard that they had these garden plots. People could have the garden plots. I was only in the barn. I was only in the barn a few times. And it was later on, uh, Frank had some old Buick headlights that mm -hmm. he had stored up there. Mm. And he knew that I kind of liked antiques and things, and so one time we went out there, and he told me where they were at, and he gave those to me. Uh. Big old brass lights that you lit. Yeah, there was a there was oh. a, a wick. Individual. No yeah. kidding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Huh. That was. Boy, I never would But I, I, I never was in the barn when they had hay or anything like that. Okay. Nor did I ever. I don't ever remember seeing the team of horses that they had down there. Now the hoax had horses and they had big mud shoes that they put on. Looked to me like they were made out of rubber tires, I don't know. Wow. But they put these shoes on the horses so they could work the low spots yeah. early in the mm -hmm. spring. And uh, I'll be darned. Yeah, that was the first time I ever saw uh, mud shoes on yeah, horses. I've, I've yeah, I've never, I've never heard of that. But yeah, as, as low and mucky as I'm sure yeah. it was and continues to be, they would have needed some way for traction. Yeah, this area right through here where all the uh, cypress yeah, are planted. Yeah, the bald cypress, right. Are, that, right. Was, that was really, I used to, we had a little Ford tractor with a big mower on the back of it. And uh, I would get this stuck many times in the yeah. spring. Okay. It, wheels only had to go around once and back and it was done, you know. But we, we lived with it. And it was Dad's idea to plant the trees. He originally said, because his thinking on it was that at the time we purchased this, he purchased this up here, and then even when we purchased here, we were still in the township. So our, our kids didn't go to Parkside School. They got on the bus up here and went out to Waterford to school. Oh, no kidding. Then when we got a new superintendent, uh, we, my wife and I got to know him pretty well, and we said, you know, that's kind of silly. The kids walk up here, and yeah. Parkside's right over here, but they go all the way out there. So he said, yeah, that is crazy. You're going to, you, you can go to Parkside. And, and then little by little, this, this area, you know, the city grew around it. Yeah. And yeah. so here this area was that was in the township, but the rest of it was, you know, I had fire protection, everything from the city. From the city. So when it came time to annex, I didn't, didn't fight it at all. I was, because I had been using all the city facilities. Yeah. And uh, our kids were now going to school in, in the city and everything like that. So when they annexed us, 
that took, I think we had nearly 80 acres at that time. Okay. And uh, okay. Uh, when that occurred, I, what I didn't realize was that they superimposed all these streets through here and divided this into lots. And I was, I was taxed on the lots. Oh, lots. And boy, my taxes just really went up. Oh, man. And uh, I had a friend who was an attorney, and I was talking to him. And I said, is there anything I can do about that? And he said, yeah. I said, you can do the same thing I did. He said, I bought a bunch of land uh, west of town. And he said, I put it into a classified forest. And he said, at that time, you're, you only know, tax a dollar an acre on it. Boy, that sounded good. And so that's what we did. We, uh, as soon as we could make the changes, we put it into a classified okay. forest. And your dad, I remember you saying your dad was, was he really helped to push you on that. Oh, idea. absolutely. So. He, he was really into, when he first was started in the veneer business, into logs and, okay. and uh, especially walnut logs. He knew that the walnut, uh, uh, because of the freezing and thawing that yeah. we had here, made the walnut have the finest grain of walnut, I guess, in the country. And uh, so he, he, if, if he would have had his way, every tree that went in was, would have been <laughs> a black walnut. walnut. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and at first, we, you could go out to the county agent's office and get 75 trees uh, you could get 25 white pines and 20, uh, whatever it was, yeah. at a very reasonable price. I'm not so sure if at first they didn't give, give them away. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. And uh, we got a couple of those bars, yep. tree planting bars, yep. and the yep. boys were old enough that they could, one would take a bunch of them in a pack and, and the other one would uh, step on the hole, push yeah, it in. Okay. And I would go along with it. Usually I'd take a, make a one furrow with a single bottom plow. And then I would go in there with the, with the bar and the boys would drop the drop tree in and step on it. And uh, that's how it got started. We, first thing we, oh, we, first we planted was this little area right here. Okay. Because that road wasn't there. When we bought the farm, this road came down and went right by the house, right by the barn, and down and to the hoaks. Okay. And uh, then we had the gravel pit over here, and we said, let's see, gravel pit was right in here, said that you mm -hmm. could, you can have the gravel out of the pit if you'll build the road. And so they did. Mm -hmm. Well, then we wanted some privacy so that we wouldn't have to hear the traffic, and that's when we planted this whole thing with white pines. Yeah, okay. They were growing and, and uh, yeah. grew up there. So that was our first first trees, the second ones okay. were over in here. You, you and I, when we went on our hike, we found those walnuts down Let's in this see. area here. Um, I think it, on this side of the creek. Um, so it would have been a yeah, this yeah, area. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, that's right. And, I think maybe a little bit more over this way, that's okay. right. And okay. the, bo the boys hand planted that whole thing because it was pretty wet into yeah. there. And, okay. uh, and we, that's where we put the burr oak Yes, that, right. Because they like to get their there. feet wet. Yep. And so we put walnuts in, and those were all hand planted. Okay. But then that was the last hand planting we did, except to replace or rebuild where they didn't they grow didn't well. Um, the state forester came in and um, with a uh, Kubota, four wheel drive Kubota. They were just kind of new at the time. Yeah, yeah. And he had a machine on the back of that that a fellow rode on. And as it went along and plowed the furrows, he dropped trees into it and it just folded them right in. <laughs> so they oh, planted wow. the whole farm then. So, the, I mean, the, all, all the other all the yeah. other portions here. Everything you know. else was, well, this out in here, we did some yeah, hand planting in there where you and I were. And we uh, that cypress. mostly was cypress yeah. in there. And that's where our exotic coffee trees grow yeah. in there. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, down into yeah. this. And that was just a, a discovery. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. The, before you can put your place into a tree farm, you have to clear cut it. And in other words, any tree that's that's cuttable, it had to be taken down. 
and, and that was in preparation so nothing would be in competition with what oh, you planted. with what you planted. And so they, they oh, would stage those logs on this hillside here. And when I would come home at noon for lunch, the, the tree cutters would be there and they'd be sharpening their saws and so on. And, and we used to play a little game, you know, can you identify what we cut this morning uh -huh. by the bark uh -huh. and so on. And uh, I thought I was pretty good at it. And, and one day they had some logs laying there and they said, we got you, you're not gonna be able to kiss them out. And sure enough, I looked at it and looked at it and then I couldn't, couldn't guess what it was. Here were those coffee those trees. coffee trees. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. oh, interesting. Um, and um, what, what, were the, what were the years when you were, when you were planting? Um, do you recall? I can pretty well tell you when we started. Um, so my wife and I put some dates together. Yeah. Uh, we purchased the farm in 61, 60, okay. 61. We built a new house down on the river in 67. Okay. And so the tree planting would have been, my guess is that it would have been pretty much in the 70s. Okay. In the early 70s. Okay. And at first we thought that we really had kind of a disaster because the deer were starting to come in and rabbits and any tree except a walnut they they, yeah. they didn't like the taste of the walnuts. Yeah. They wouldn't cut those. But all the rest of them, they cut them off, cut them yeah. off, cut them yeah. off. You could just walk down a row and there's a little sharp yes. cut all the way. Ah. And so I complained to the forester. I said, I've got to have something to spray on those or do something yeah. so that they don't eat them because they're killing all my trees. He said, they're not. He said, what's happening is just like they got a severe pruning. And he said, the, the yeah. roots are going to grow. And he said, about two or three years, all of a sudden that tree is going to take off that you thought we had been cut back because it has such a good root system. Yeah. And then he said it'll just, and sure enough, that's exactly what happened. It was about three years after, they, after they were planted that uh, we could see. I had a backpack sprayer and I put a funnel on the front of the nozzle and so that and it was, I would tip it down and I'd go around each tree and spray it uh, usually in the spring and then again maybe between 4th of July <clears throat> and August, something like that. And that controlled the weed growth oh, around okay. the tree. Yeah. And so. uh, later on, they more or less stopped that, said, you know, that's not necessary. You don't need to mow between them or anything yeah. like that, yeah. uh, which made the farm look more messy because <laughs> the weeds had grown up and so on. But uh, the trees seem to just kind of take care of themselves. And then yeah, you could right, tell yeah. as the trees begin to grow, uh, all of the environment changed. The, uh, you know, we didn't have anything but rabbits and things like that, the, the normal stuff. But boy, as the trees began to grow, the birds changed. Yeah. Uh, we had, oh, four or five years there that we had so many bluebirds uh, oh, I never saw yes. so many bluebirds. And that was right when that lady wrote the story about the Silent Spring, and DDT, and, and, yeah. uh, and the uh, yeah. eggshells, and yeah. so on. Yeah. And we were just doing fine down there. Yeah. Every, every bluebird house I put up had bluebirds in it because the trees were just high enough that they could perch. That's and right. And that's what yeah. they liked. And there was enough open space for them to feel yeah. comfortable. And it, it was amazing how we saw the change. Then the, the big spruce trees that I planted mm -hmm. along here, yeah. I had that, in that time you had antennas on your roof yeah. for TV, yeah. and about 4.30, 5 o'clock, I would begin to get shadows on my screen and my TV, and sure enough, I'd go out and there'd be a big red tail hawk oh. up there, and these trees were just big enough that the doves liked to nest in them at night, mm -hmm. And, and of course they would fly across the road and fly across the road. And when he got the right one, he'd just big dive off of there and the feathers would fly. He'd perch on the antenna. On the antenna, he? yeah. He, <laughs> and uh, he really got the velocity coming down from that. And, and the feathers would fly and we knew that he got his dinner for that <laughs> night. And, and then pretty soon, they, I don't know whether they got big enough that the doves could hide better or what it was, but. We didn't see them around much yeah. then after that. Yeah. But there were always things that we never saw before, wildlife that we didn't see before. 
uh, river otters okay. came down there and beaver yeah. came down right. there and, uh, and it all seemed to, the more dense it became, the more the animal and wildlife were things that we'd never seen before. Yeah. But I, I thought that was amazing, uh, that tree I mean, brought all that in. Uh, I mean, that, that transformation must have, must have been incredible to watch, to go from, um, from, some of it was just field, is that right? Yes, yes. Or, or pasture? Yeah, or, you know, little, oh yeah, before it was Did nothing, you, we made, made hay on right. it, and okay. that was it, yeah. And, and, and to see it transform from, from that into this emerging forest, Along with along with everything else that came along, uh. well, by the way, the transition that took place there, we all had had guns back in those days, and did a lot of rabbit hunting and so on like that. But the tree farm stopped all that. We every everybody in the family stopped hunting yeah. on that, that because we that you just saw so much going yeah. on. One day my wife called me at the office and she said, you, you won't believe what's sitting in our side yard. And it was a red uh, fox. And we'd never seen fox <laughs> on the farm. And there it was, just nonchalant out there. And, and, and deer, oh, we had so many deer. Well, and I remember you, you saying that as, uh, when you were growing up, you never saw deer. No. And, nope. and you, you remember very clearly the first time you saw a deer track. Yeah. Why don't you tell that story? That's, it's, and I mean, you know that was too. right down here behind the Murray home, or uh, yeah, Frank's place, okay. right along that creek that ran behind the house uh -huh. uh, that was soft enough there that I saw a deer track. And uh, I was really into tracks at that time. I think I was working on a merit badge for Boy oh, Scouts. Okay. And uh, I saw this and I looked at it and I thought, boy, that's a deer track. I ran home, got my dad, and I said, Dad, there's a deer track down here at the river. No, he said, it's not a deer track, it's probably a hog. Because he said they have a cleft foot, like somebody's hog got out and was running down there. And I said, you got to look at it, it looks like a deer to me. So he came down with me and looked at it. He said, you know, I believe that is a deer. He said, I can't believe we got a deer up here. <laughs> and then, you know, it just blossomed. Oh, I don't know how many deer. I had put a little feeder sure. out here in the front yard, and I would drive home, had an old Chevy truck, and I would drive home, and the deer would hear that truck. Huh. And by the time I got here, I had cracked corn, and I'd get corn, put it out in that little calf feeder. By the time I got over here, the deer were already starting to gather out here in the edges of the trees to come in and eat. We had lots of deer, and then we cross country skied oh, at night. Yeah. Oh. And uh, when they were bedded down, you could get very close to them. They'd lift their heads up and look at you, but they didn't get up and run or anything. <laughs> when there was snow on the ground, yeah, it, was snow. Yeah. it was a great, great place to raise children. And, and uh, the things that I that I really loved were abounding. <laughs> you know, it was it was a great place. But Dad's philosophy was that if we put this in the trees yeah. and the city grew all around it to surround it, that there would be enough tree huggers <laughs> that they wouldn't make it into tennis courts and golf course if we gave it to the city. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So his dream always was that, that that would be an area where the people in town could walk and, and observe wildlife and so on I mean, like that. I, I think that is just an incredibly prescient kind of vision that your dad had um, yeah. because because that's uh, in fact what we've seen happen right I mean, yeah that's, yeah um, I mean it, it is turned in and you can see all the trails that, that are through there there are birders out hiking right now and I mean daily there are so many people who who go through there adults and kids school groups that we take into there mm -hmm. uh, you know who bikers, who, bikers that's right who are using using the woods that you planted exactly the way your dad envisioned. I mean, it's, um, and, and of course, it's part of this, this larger kind of green corridor that extends all the way down from the damn pond, all the way up to, you know, to, to the edge of downtown. Yeah, um, and how that's beginning to develop down there. I drove by that, couldn't believe what was going on. Yeah, right, yeah, along, along yeah. the mill race, kind of further up in here. That's wonderful. Um, that's what so it, I mean. It's uh, I mean, that, that the vision that he and you and your family had and, and created um, 
you know, decades ago has, has, turned, has turned into that reality. I wonder if maybe this would be a good transition to, to actually go out, um, unless, should we sit down for a little bit? Um, That's um, going out would be fine. Why, why, why don't we do yeah. that? Um, and we can tell one more story. Yeah, yeah. I just happened to think about it. You do know, we, we lived in the Bahamas for a while. Yeah. And one day I actually got a long distance call from Mayor Kaufman. Mm. And he said, uh, one of your beavers cut down a tree and it put a 72,000 volt line out, and the entire mall doesn't have any electricity. And I want to know what you're going to do about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my of course, gosh. it was a big joke, you know? <laughs> and I stuttered. I was chairman of the of the park department or board at that yeah. time, and I, I thought I ought to, you know, I kind of thought he was serious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then we got a good laugh out of it. It was one of my beaver dropped a line. <laughs> <laughs> mm, that's good. That's good. That is good. Yeah, well, a, lot, a lot of good memories. Let's let's do go out and walk a little bit, and that may jog some other memories too. Um, grab my notes here too. I'm I'm so glad you made it over for a little I bit. Am too. I don't. This is great to hear all these stories, and I can just <laughs> listen to them all day. Well, oh, I'm glad that I can yeah. contribute whatever. Is this is this area, of course, is dear to my heart, and you yeah. know the older the older you get. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, the things that you took for granted as you were oh, younger all of a sudden sure. became really important. Oh, no. sure. We had so much fun with this pond when we dug that pond that all the springs from up here came down and went through this and went down a kind of an old creek bed and into the river here. Well, we put a levee across that, blocked those, and it, it, all the springs and everything just went into the pond. And we had a, a little house, a little mm. cottage there. And uh, we just had so much fun with that. Just had so much fun with that. The ice skating in the wintertime and swimming in the summertime. We'd play tennis over here. And when we got yeah. done, we'd all go down and jump in the pond. And yeah. it, it just brings back memories. And I, I mm. just wrote a book uh, mm. about when we lived in the Bahamas and how we built a cottage and so on. But we, the, river came up and froze ice all around this and finally the, the old pond house gave up and we lost the footers and so on. But I, that was all made out of treated lumber and I salvaged that and that was what I used to prefabricate a little cottage that we sent down to the Bahamas and down to the Bahamas. <laughs> made, our, made our cottage down there. So the pond house lives on. <laughs> I'll stick this in my pocket yeah, in case we I'm, need a date. I've got some notes here right. too that. Um, oh, we, I didn't tell the story. That we need to, two things we need to point out. Okay. Um, one, when we decided to put it into a tree farm, this was in the city limits. And Mr. Presser, who was the county treasurer, uh -huh. said that he would not allow us to put it into a tree farm because he was going to lose that tax base. And because it was in the city limits, and that classified forests are not allowed in city limits. So I took for granted it wasn't allowed. But a fellow that I had served on with the county parks, Francis Datna, had okay. a brother who was a state forester, Frank Datna. And uh, he called his brother and asked him about it. His brother said, That doesn't make sense. That's not true. Hmm. And uh, so he then called me and he said, you go back up to that office. He said, how long does it take you to get there? And I said, oh, 10, 15 minutes. He said, you go back up there and you tell him to register this because if he doesn't, I think it was the mayor or the governor was in the fellow that was a physician from Bremen. Anyways, we'll, have, we'll talk to him directly. <laughs> and I, I went up and he wouldn't talk to me, but he sent his receptionist or something out and I signed all the papers and so on and, and he I don't think he ever talked to me again <laughs> but that was a that was a conflict that we had oh, that's the other thing that I wanted to point out 
not that I anticipate any difficulty at all, because he's a good fellow and good cooperative fellow. But when we turn this, uh, let's see, Jim owns, yeah. owns this land. Yeah. And when we signed the agreement on that, in there is a lifelong agreement that he can determine wherever the path is mm. that the people get from here to here. To here. Uh, but he must always provide a path. For him. Yeah. Okay. I don't think you'll ever have a conflict, but if one of his children should take it over, or two children, or something like that, mm. good to know that that exists. Yeah. That yeah. they're the, the owner of this property. Yeah. And this has to always provide a, a passage. A, a passage. Now he okay. could, if he wanted to, he could bring that clear around here like this. Yeah. But he does have to provide a passage on. Okay. It. Or whoever ever owns it. Is. Usually, yeah. those things never have any difficulty with the first owner. It's mm -hmm. when you get to the, and yeah. the second or third owner doesn't even know it exists. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, okay. so, and that's important. We wouldn't want to get that cut off. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. And we didn't talk about how that came about. Um, this Murray property came up for sale, which included this field. Well, it included all of this, all of this, okay. and then all of this. That came up for sale, and all kinds of people wanted to buy that. There was a big, big turnout for the auction. And uh, a lady from South Bend just bid it up and bid it up and bid it up, till finally it, it, no one could pay that kind of money and knew it wasn't worth that kind of money. Uh, but anyway, she got it, and then she never never made a deposit or did anything more with it and obviously didn't have the money to buy it. But the city of Goshen had to go through all kinds of court action and so on to finally get the reversal that she wasn't going to have that land. And when they did that, they never advertised it. They never put it up again. <laughs> Phil Barker came to me and he said, you still want that North Field? And I said, yeah, I sure do. And he said, okay, here's how much it is. And I bought it. It was never put up Just for like auction. <laughs> no one else got a chance to buy it, nothing like that. And this down here, they decided they were going to make that part of the park program, gave that to the park. Mm -hmm. and, and their main reason is they wanted to close this bridge. They didn't want to have to maintain that bridge anymore. Yeah. But uh, I suppose mm -hmm. someone could have really raise some static on that if they wanted to get in and buying the field. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's I don't right. remember what I paid for. It was reasonable, but it was not unreasonable at all. It was just the process. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let, let, let me ask you this too before we head out. Were, were portions of this property used by by the highway department, either the county or the city, kind of as a, as a holding ground for like gravel or salt? Or, or those kinds of materials, do you? Not that you know? I can ever remember, okay. no, no, okay. uh-uh. Okay. No, the only thing I can remember is that when they started to develop Shanklin Park and they put posts or light posts or ran electricity, we came up with all kinds of white wall tires and Back into uh, here, is that? No, in this area over here. Over in here. Yeah, yeah that, was, that right. was all junk. Yeah. And every so often with the swimming pool, they have an area settle, yeah. you know, yeah. because that, that was just a... It still a, happens a, a, back a, here. Yeah. A dump back there, yeah. yeah. But I think mm -hmm. that's all the things that I had down. Okay. Well, let's, um, let's head out and we'll walk a little bit and see what, what jogs your memory. The... Uh, I had always been told when I was hooked up with the board and went to some conferences, one was down at Indianapolis, and I remember him saying that how parks and recreation departments would improve the entire real estate of a town. Yeah. And especially yeah. the real estate next to a trail. Yeah. And of course at that time we were fighting with everybody to try to put a trail in. They wouldn't, didn't want it in their backyard, you know, and all that stuff. But this boy, is the pumpkin it, vine in particular you're talking about? Uh, well, that and, the, and the, the one down 8th Street, we really yeah. had a terrible time with that. Yeah. Right. So it, uh, it has really, really paid off. Just oh. really a beautiful 
thing there, to, to there occur. There is just no doubt that, that the trail systems that were built initially and then, and then those that have followed have, have really contributed so much to the, you know, to, to the way the city thinks and feels and operates. Yeah, uh, no question about it. Nice. Yeah, now this was the area that was all from that big old wolf oak there. Uh, that was all orchard. That was all orchard. Yeah, back down here. over okay. the hillside and down here with okay. pretty flat ground, and that was all different kinds of apples. Wasn't okay. anything in it but apples. Okay. Apple trees, and then of course the riverbank here down, and then this is where we did all our fishing and so on in that yeah, stretch there. Yeah, right. Okay. Okay. Well, and the, what you just called old wolf oak. I mean, that's been there for quite a while. Yes. I mean, they, you remember that one from your childhood? Yeah, because. Um, well, see, it it never turned into a to a beautiful oak tree. I mean, it's a beautiful oak tree, but it was what we call a wolf oak because yeah. it just spread out, it's just and, out and the they open. would never make a log or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I mean that that's a white oak, and I often point this one out to kids when we yeah. come yeah. on. Yeah, good, field good trips. point. Good point. Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. and then tell them the difference between the white oak and the red oak. That's right. Well, yeah. and, and the, this is a shingle right next to it, and so I, we, all, we always point out the differences between those Yeah, two. you said that was a shingle oak the other day, and, and yeah. that was kind of amazing to me because I didn't remember that that leaf was an indicator of a shingle oak. I, in fact, I, I would have had trouble uh, identifying that. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. But isn't that beautiful and restful? It, and it is. You couldn't it is. ask for anything. And I mean, this this whole area back here is. I mean, people have weddings back here. Oh or, yeah. You know, I mean, it's just it's such a lovely little corner. And and this is where the orchard was. That's that's right. Right. Um, yeah. The whole, up on the hillside was a chicken house, a small chicken okay, house. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, and I think I might have mentioned one time you and I were talking. That's where I got my first dog. The uh, there was a, a wild dog down here, and yeah, okay. it crawled under there and had puppies. And as those puppies got old enough, uh, I got one of them, and another neighbor boy got one, and that was my first dog. That was your first dog. Yeah. <laughs> a pup of the wild dog that lived in yeah. the chicken house. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and I mean, so here are these other white oaks here at the top of the bank, and and these are these they look are like shade bark too. hickory. Um, yeah, if you if you follow them out to the leaves, then um, you will see yep. that that they're uh, yeah they're white oaks. And, um, yeah, they, they sure are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they are they are quite impressive too, the way they I mean the way they spill out all oh, the way this boy, far. Yeah, look at that. They are something else. There's one sycamore. I, I remember this area being all sycamores. Okay. I, I don't oh, remember the oaks being along here. Well the the sycamores are in there. Yeah, for I sure. see them through there. That's right. And and a bunch of dead ash too now. Oh um, yeah. Standing yeah. standing dead. Um, yeah, but I'd like to stop at the uh, at the foundation, the okay. barn foundation. Um, well, the weather's turned out really nice for us today. Yeah. So now a lot of this then has transformed also since you were a kid. Yes, amen. Uh, yeah, of course, n none of those trees there. Right, were, right. That was all open. And I remember that the, the level of the barn, you, this was cut down just like it is now. So mm -hmm. when you drove a hay wagon in here, okay. that was almost at the level 
of the level of the barn. The barn. And so it was easy to unload and, and load things. So the, there would have been a, a door, an opening of the barn right, at, right. at the top of the foundation there, the, yeah. what's left of the foundation. Yep, and that mm. would have been the first floor of the barn. Okay. It was a two-story barn, uh, and I think, you know, it seems to me that the doors, there were sliding doors on this side of the barn, the front side of the barn. Okay. Uh, but then again, I remember walking out into the yard and seeing doors, so they must have been on the other side too. So oh. I'm not sure exactly how the doors were arranged Yeah. Okay. On the on the barn. How big a barn might that have not, been? Not large, not, not large. large. Yeah, it started from this corner here, and, and I suspect maybe where those little kind of bushy area was. Yeah, okay. it, was it wasn't much deeper than that, if even that much. Yeah, well, it was okay. not a big, a large barn yeah. at all. But it served it served the purpose for what was needed. Yeah, for what, they, what they did. Yeah. Now, the creek was just over that rise down okay. there in the bottom. It wasn't out towards the river. It was more back, mm. just right at the foot okay. of the of the hill of there. The, hill, the, the creek ran right there into the river. Okay. And like I say, that that creek was a. It had kind of a gravelly, sandy bottom in yeah. that area, and that's where we used to get uh, crawfish and things out to to go okay. fishing with. You know, we'd take a little seine and get minnows and things like that out of it. And it's back, back down behind there is where Ernie was. Well, that found. was right, that right, yeah, right out in this area here, <laughs> right out in this area here. Uh, I suppose he saw the buildings and so on here and decided his time was up or something or other, you know. And, yeah. and over in there is where he shot himself. And there was a line fence went right down through there. So I suspect right in here someplace where I was on the fence post. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> Well, I couldn't see, you know. I was yeah, just a yeah. little kid, so I couldn't. And you needed and, to see. <laughs> oh gosh, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Then the 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 house. Yeah. Right. The salt. The salts lived in that end of the duplex, and the renters lived in this end. In this end. Yeah. Now this would have been all part of the barn. All right. Okay. Right, and you can kind of see the corner. Yep. Right there. So the so the barn would have extended over this way. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Boy, the hill starts right down over there, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <coughs> it does. So the house set right in here. Okay. And the, and the barn must have been. I think it was a bit of an angle. Okay. But it it wasn't too far away from the house. But there was distance between the. The edge of the house and where the where okay. the barn was. Okay, so maybe the barn was oriented a bit more this way. Huh? Yeah. Is that, yeah. Okay. Okay. And then and then the the house kind of in here. Yeah, the house would have. Again, the house was right on the on the top. The top, yeah. Because I I remember that one of the renters or so threw junk over the edge. <laughs> of it, and as a, my brother and I didn't like that. Yeah, I didn't yeah. think they should do that. Yeah. But yeah. then it flooded, you know, and carried it all away. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> right. That's, that's the brilliance of throwing your trash in the river. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah, the house would have been right in this area here, okay. and, and the Murray house was right over there. And the, okay, and so the Murray. Um, I mean, so this is this is the track, or would have been the road down to the yeah. This this bridge. lane went between this house. I'm not so sure that the lane was this far back. I think maybe it was up a, a little more this okay. way. But the Frank Murray home was right, right in here. Right in Had here. a nice porch on it with a lot of gingerbread around it, and uh, it was just. It was a nice house, a nice and not not a big spacious home like the Latta home or something like that. But okay. it was it was a nice house, and uh, it was you could tell that it had a lot of loving care yeah. on it to put into it. It was yeah. it was nice. And then where all the secondary growth is, that was all a truck patch. Oh, that was okay. that was all garden sure. right up to the edge of the canal. 
that the Murrays were maintaining. Or, right, yeah, right, okay. that's right. Okay. Yeah, they could look out their window and see us if we decided we wanted to borrow some of their asparagus. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's what you're referring to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what fun we had with that bridge. That was. They told me that that bridge came from somewhere, somewhere else that it had been taken off. Oh, oh, but I, yeah, I don't know that that's for right. a fact. Um, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think there's maybe a plaque on it that that says. Um, somewhere else in the ocean that it was that it was moved it's on from. State road somewhere. Yeah, right. Is that right? Yeah. I okay. Which one. Well, I was always Bad. told that that bridge wasn't made for the for here. That it, they've got it from some yeah. they salvaged it from somewhere yeah, else. That's right. That's right. And uh, how deep was the race when you were jumping off of it? That's a great great question. How yeah. deep was the race? Well, let's see. It was over our heads. We were probably most of us five feet at that. So it was. Oh gosh, my my guess was that it was somewhere between and not ten feet deep, but um, more probably in the five to eight feet. Uh -huh. eight, eight feet, I would say, yeah. would have been, yeah. been deep. Now okay. there were some holes that were bigger than that down by the old ice cream plant. Uh, well, it's not. It was the Cosmoff junkyard then, I think. Okay. Down in that area where the where it widens out. Yes. And gets, yeah. That's right. where the ice house was. That that's was the they, ice. they made okay. ice and they had a big ice house there. That they supplied ice to the town. To the town. They, they cut it out of there in the winter. Yeah, in the winter. In they cut that out, and then they had huge piles of sawdust, and okay. they they put a layer in and sawdust, and another layer and in sawdust, it. and so on. And, yeah. yeah. And long in August, that would get pretty low. That uh, from. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Anybody need any? Uh, you want me to spray you or? Sure. Or hold? Okay. Uh, under your clothes at all? Um, back of your neck? Your leg. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need any layer? No, I'm fine. No. Okay. I'm doing okay. fine. So far, I haven't been bothered at all. All right, all right. Um, Did you ever get any river rash or? Any weird sicknesses oh, from, from swimming in that? Water? No, you know, back in those days, uh, Nipsco was generating power down at the other okay. end. Okay, yeah, right. And they would, we had a swimming hole behind our house up there. And uh, what would happen about one, right around one o'clock or so, and I remember that time because in those days, if you went swimming within an hour after you had eaten, you definitely would have cramps and die. There's no question about that. <laughs> yeah. And and we used to, you know, keep asking my mother, what time is it? What time is it? Because uh, we wanted to go swimming and yeah. we didn't want to die. Uh, uh, and so a lot of a lot of times we would we would uh, right around 1:30, they would the canal would get real high. I don't. I guess they closed the gates down there. Okay. But the canal would get get quite a bit deeper than what yeah. it was. It would be up closer to the edges, and then all of a sudden, the current would start up, and then boy, there would be really strong current, oh, no and we kind of loved to swim in that with yeah. the, and fight that current yeah. and so on, and that would pull all the weeds and stuff out. It would wash out the, any oh, weeds geez. that were growing or Just, anything. Yeah, yeah. So that Flush place. Unless it would be where there was a curve or something, there was no silt in it. It had yeah. all, it was all gravel yeah. from being washed out uh, from that. And they would Regular. do that once a day. Yeah, okay. And, and then they had a man, a fellow by the name of Dorset, that used to walk the canal. Okay. Uh, and I think he walked it every day from the head gates to the gates down there. And he looked for things that would clog up the canal or if there was a, a muskrat hole, they, they put poison peanuts in the muskrat <laughs> holes and things like that. Um, and then that, those, that was where our kids uh, trapped. They'd get about oh, anywhere between 50, 60 muskrats between yeah. this bridge and the head gates. And Gee, man, me. They, would, they ran, I don't know, 30, 40 traps uh, down to here. Then they walked down here and they sometimes they would have traps in the creek, 
and sometimes they would have traps in the river, there weren't nearly as much muskrat activity in these areas, so they yeah. would change the line, but okay. they could walk it in a circle that way. Yeah, right. So every right. evening they would, usually right after dinner, they'd run the trap line. It was a good experience for them. Yeah. They, they made some money. Did they? Of it. Sure, yeah. They uh, made. From the pelts or something? Yeah, back then muskrats were selling for, oh, five bucks uh, a pelt. No kidding. Yeah, and they, they, they met a fella out here on Plymouth Avenue that, that bought the fur at the sale barn. And uh, of course, year after year, they found out that if they kept all their fur until actually the season closed, then that would be the highest prices. Oh, right. So they would stop and see him and find out what the prices were and so on like that. And he, he loved the kids. He, he would show them how to skin and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, uh, then they would get all put them in a big cardboard box and sell them. And, this is your kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah there were the two boys, and they so one would run it one night or one would run it on the weekends or yeah. something like that, and then they split it. They were pretty good. They could could skin a muskrat pretty fast. <laughs> Do you mind if we walk in a little further? No, there? no, I'm, okay? I'm I'm ready to go with you guys. Whatever you, you want, and of course I enjoy every minute in okay. it. Let me know if anybody needs more spray or, or spray at all. And just be careful, Dave, you don't trip. <laughs> I kind of lose my bearings here. Uh -huh. uh, this has changed so much. But I, I'm sure the houses, I, I think this, I don't think this lane was this far over. I think it was, it was more over in there. More over in there? Yeah. Right, okay. Uh, because I think the house has actually spilled out here a little bit okay. on this flat, the flatter ground, and then this is eroded. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah. Well, and Larry, I remember you last time noting the large sycamores over here, kind of on the ridge here. Yeah. The, the, you, you were recall those. Yes, yes. Um, no, they are really, they are just pretty dramatic specimens back in there. Yeah, boy, those are big. They are big. We hunted lots of mushrooms in here, and uh, lots of what? Mushroom. Mushroom. Yeah. yeah okay. And as I remember, the the sycamores kind of stood out by themselves. You know, they were. Yeah. They were really towering. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they they continue to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got plenty of uh, walnut down through here now, don't we? Yeah. There is there is quite a bit of walnut down through here, and. You you and your family planted these the yeah. walnut down here. Most of this stuff in this low ground here was hand planted. Yeah. Uh, okay. If we could get the tractor in with a single bottom plow, we would lay lay down the sod. Okay. And then in that furrow is where we would plant the trees. And I, yeah. And I I try to make those furrows six feet apart. Okay. Uh, so you know they they plant them six on six. The, yeah, you got the white pines to make the hardwoods grow. Yep, and then, and then they die out, which is what's happening now. The, the yeah. pines are gone. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Maybe we can walk down at least. Do you know far, what's going maybe. on that we get the blue water in the creek? Yet? Yeah, it's um, it's uh, as I understand it is some effluent from uh, the dairy uh, the dairy processing plant here, Dairy, dairy Farmers of America. Um, where they are um, processing powdered milk, I think is how I've heard Okay, it over there at the milk industry. Yeah, right, over, okay. over New York, New York Street. Um, it's, it's monitored pretty closely and um, it's not, as I understand, it's, it's not supposed to be, uh, you know, toxic or detrimental to the, to the, ecosystem okay. um, but it does have a distinct hue doesn't it yeah um, it definitely has a distinct hue and okay and so I mean Larry you're saying that that this was cut channel the channels cut through here that's right originally it went back kind of along the bottom of the of yeah the it ridge. took the lowest spot here okay and turned and went right behind the houses okay. over to the river over there yeah yeah okay okay and then we looked at the old pile of stone out here that yeah that's right there. yeah down this path you're right and around 
Yeah. And say again, that was stone. That was the old WPA days uh, during the Depression, and what they did was stream improvement. They piled those stones on top of each other and made like a little kind of a coffer dam, and oh. fish and so on was attracted in, okay. in to that. And uh, now with all the floods and everything, most of that has has washed out. But when we were kids. You could walk out there if you know barefooted, and you yeah. could feel where the rocks were. Yeah. And there's another place where they've done that, right down by the Plymouth Avenue Bridge, okay. about okay. a half a half a block up. There's, and that yeah. one was still standing when I was a kid. Okay. You could that, that still had a bunch of raised rocks. Because that would have been that would, WPA. That would have been the 30s, right? Mm -hmm. When that was, and, and so right. Right. Larry and I found some of the remains of one of those rubble piles down this path around the corner that would have presumably been dumped as yeah, part of that project. Apparently they didn't finish the project or they left that there to add more to it yeah, later okay. on or something. But for a long time there was quite a pile of riprap and, and concrete okay. and so on and uh, no, no trees or anything grew there because it was a big enough pile. Yeah, okay. Okay. Wow, well, this is beautiful. It is gorgeous. It, it's it is just incredibly gorgeous, Larry. Uh, and it is just about impossible for me to imagine it as as field. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the winter time, when we would get a snow, all the rabbit tracks would lead to that pile of rocks. Because oh, that's where they had their little in. hutches inside there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so Larry, the, um, that pile back there makes me think of um, what we also looked at last time we hiked back in, in, the, in the far, far corner where the rubber yes. is. That's um, right. Can, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about... Um, about how that came to be there. One of the Hoke boys, there were 11 children in that family, and one of the boys owned a rubber company. And uh, he needed a place to get rid of his scrap rubber. And, and, uh, and John Hoke, who was running the farm, needed something to block up where the river was trying to cut through on that, oh. that west, the yeah. northwest uh, side of the, of the farm. Where it's so low and a bit of a natural channel, right. so he they would haul this rubber scrap and 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 pile it up across these washouts and try to keep the river from cutting through there. And and now what we have is is still that old rubber being strewn around by floods and, yeah, and so on. That's right. And it doesn't disintegrate. It it just it's just there. There, for, yeah. Um, that would have been. What, 40s? They were still dumping when we built our house. Oh, they were, okay. Yeah, and they, they started dumping there on the, on the what we call Murray's Hole, right on the bend of the river. Okay. And, and okay. We, as soon as we bought the farm, we stopped that. No, no more dumping yeah. on the farm. But uh, that was kind of an eyesore out in front of our, our new home. Where yeah. That, that rubber was exposed. Little okay. by little, I got fill dirt over the top of it and uh -huh. grew myrtle on it. Yeah, okay. and, and that made okay. it all, it looked a lot okay. nicer after that. See, we should be keeping our eye out for some of the walnuts. And in fact, here are two of them. Um, yeah. I yeah. suspect that those must be some of what you planted. Um, yeah, I always call this uh, this is with the boys' walnuts. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Might be some tulip poplar scattered around in here, too. Yeah, yep. And I know without a doubt that there, uh, over on this side, that there is, there, there's bur oak. Um, yeah, we found some we the saw other day. Some out there. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
a fellow by the name of Schrock here in town. I think he was a city councilman at one time. Somehow organized a group of people. The river was getting a lot of debris and log jams. Okay. And uh, he got some, I don't know whether it was Indiana Wood or who, or who it was, but they came to, in here with those big, what they call tree farmers. They have uh, a motor and a driver, but there's a big universal joint in the middle of it. Yeah. And yeah. they can haul trees and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And they came in and actually drove down the river. They they oh. they had they were so elevated that they could could they could run get right in. into the bed and uh, and they dumped all the logs out pulled them out the side and wired them to other trees and so yeah, on wow and uh, really opened up the river the idea behind it was that it was it was going to flow faster and yeah. and so on like that and they could run canoes down through yeah right but you know it didn't last long they. Uh, uh, it wasn't long till bang, there was more, more log jams. It doesn't take long at all. Yeah, yeah. Before it, before it clogs up again, that's for sure. Um, when you were young, did the river freeze over? No. No. Okay. No, I never saw the Elkhart River freeze over. Okay. Yeah, I guess it was there were enough springs in it that it kept that water warm enough. Warm enough that it didn't. Uh, now I saw ice okay. out on it, you know, yeah. but okay. almost always there was an opening in the middle where the main current was. Okay. The temperature of the water and the current kept it from freezing it was enough up. to keep it from freezing. Right. Now it was a different story with the canal. That, okay. In fact, we tried one year when. Uh, one of the other superintendents were here. We tried, I think we had a child drowned down, mm. down by Reith Riley oh. through the ice. And mm. so we drained it down so it was just a few feet deep at all or very shallow. Yeah. And we thought the idea would be it would freeze solid and we'd have this huge long ice skating rink oh. uh, so oh. it would give recreation. Yeah. And it would be safe. If anyone right. fell through, they could touch bottom. Yeah. And, well, what we did was kill off all the oh. all the animals, the turtles, yeah. the, the crawfish, frogs, uh, and all those things that, that dig into the mud and yeah. for the winter. Yeah. And boy, when the water came in, when we up the water in the spring, it was it was like dealing with skeletons. Oh, you know. No kidding. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, we we learned our lesson that that mm -hmm. wasn't it wasn't the, the, the detriment. Yeah, it was much worse than it was for what we tried <laughs> to cure. Yeah, so we didn't didn't have, now. See here, we still have some pines. Yeah, right. That have managed to get enough light that they right. that they survive. They they are they're hanging in there yet, but you it know it won't be long. It won't be long. I mean, um, you look at. You look at you look at a tulip tree like this one, and um, I mean it's it's beginning to overtop. The, yeah, and when that pine. occurs, it won't be long. Yeah, yeah, it won't be long. Um, that one came out pretty good. A lot of the tulips lost their tops. Yeah, get blown out. When that. Um, yeah. um, not a hurricane. What do you call it? A tornado. tornado. Yeah. That's when a right. tornado came through down yeah. here, it took the tops out of the tulip popper. They were so soft. Yeah, they are. Uh, yeah. But that one came through pretty good shape. Yeah, that one did. That one did. Um, well, and that guy who just came walking out of here with his dog, you know, he's one of these folks who's he doesn't realize, you know, oh, what went into it. Yeah. yeah. Well, Who made so, this woods for them? <laughs> just so they can enjoy it. That's the important thing. Shall um, we walk down this one? Yeah, let's walk okay. down this way a little bit. This one okay with you, yep. Dave? All right. Do you need some more spray? No, I'm good. No? Okay. Well, and Larry, just so you know, one of the things that I'm working on with uh, Parkside Elementary second graders 
for this fall, well, this entire school year, is to spend time actually in this particular part of the woods, um, uh, hopefully as much as like three hours. We'll do some hiking, they'll do some kind of sitting and observing, and then what, what I'm especially excited about is providing them some time to play out here in the woods. I golly. And uh, I mean, I, I'm so excited about this. The teachers are excited about this. Um, we've talked with Wellingtons about using this portion. I mean, you can see right here where I, I think it's probably some of the Wellington kids who've done this. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, right, very good. And so many kids, unlike you, uh, don't have that experience of just, you know, playing out in the woods. Uh, that's and right. It's going to be so interesting to observe these kids. They're not going to know what to do. <laughs> oh, this is fantastic. That's but, great. Um, that's that's, that's uh, what we are working on for this year, and hopefully that's a, you know, something we can grow. Get them out in the woods and let them figure it out. That's great. You know, we used to call this area down here, uh, especially on the other side, Mendy's Woods, uh, a fellow by the name of Mendenhall used to teach shop in the old okay. junior high school. Okay. And he would, we in the spring, no, in the fall, in the fall, we had to collect so many leaves and oh, identify them. Okay. And he would bring us down in his truck or car and turn us loose. Yeah. And uh, we were supposed to be at a certain spot at a certain time, and <laughs> uh, and then he would take us back to the school, and we all would collect our leaves and paste them in a scrapbook and, and identify them. And so we always called it Mendy's Woods. <laughs> yeah, I've got my orientation a little better than I had when you and I were out okay. the other day. Okay. It was, uh, I, I really got turned around quick. Well, uh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> it's, it has changed. Yeah, you can see the cottonwoods peeking through. Yeah, you're up right. Through there. You're right. I that low ground always had huge cottonwoods growing in it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, right. It is it is decidedly lower out that way from where we are here, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And when we planted, we 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 followed that low spot. It it runs on a curve, starts the river, okay, comes out and kind of comes back. Actually, the final end of it is out in the front field out there of the house. Oh, where the, yeah. That, that's sort of where it ended. Um, and Adam Scharf, who, who owns the, the whole homestead there, mm -hmm. he's, he has dug a pond there now. Um, I don't know whether you've ever noticed that. Uh, I think I did see that there was a pond there a few years back. I drove down through there. Yeah, yeah. Well, it should hold water. They used to have a spring house out there where they oh. kept their butter and everything. Did they? Yeah, it was on the road that came down about halfway down between the bridge and the house. They had a little building built there, uh -huh. and uh, uh, I think they'd taken some field tiles out, okay. and the water ran through that, and that's where they kept their th okay. their milk and stuff to cool it. Was that still there when you bought the property? No, no. the foundation was there, okay. but not the not the building anymore. Not the building anymore. Look, look at it, look at this tulip tree here, Larry. Look at that. Yeah. Oh gosh. Oh. Wow. Isn't that something? Oh yeah, I guess so. <laughs> well, what would you guess that? How tall would you guess oh, that? Oh goodness. Um it's it's at least sixty. It's gotta be it's gotta be pushing seventy, maybe more. I mean you can't even really see the top of it. That is what a, what I a tower. I suppose eventually those cottonwood trees will die. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And then these others will take over. That's right. Right. I think you're right. You're right. <laughs> Somewhere in here. I planted a 
burr oak tree for my dad. I think I might have shared yes. with you that. Yeah. Uh, you and I thought I would yeah. come back here and I would find that burr oak and see how it's doing. <laughs> Boy, that was a wishful thinking. <laughs> Well, hopefully it's still in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, my. Hey, I noticed, uh, and I suppose the park department did this, planted, is it um, um, crab apple along the canal bank? There are some crab apple, yeah, that were, and uh, I think some service berry maybe. Those were planted, um, actually, those were planted like 14 years ago, um, shortly before I started. Um, the hospital began to donate trees to the I city. I see, I see. And th those were some of the first trees that were planted with that donation. Um, and that was just before I started, yeah. Well, they're pretty, it looks nice. Yeah. I, I'm kind of surprised because they always are trying to keep trees off the levee. Well, right. Because and of the so roots, but it. We, we, didn't, we didn't plant any more since then. <laughs> Grandfather those in. That's you know? right, Yeah. that's right. Now, if I was going to turn my body so I was looking at the corner of the house, would I be about right? Uh, the house that you built? Yeah. Um, it'd actually be back more this, this way. way yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. And uh, I mean, the Hoke, the Hoke house would be kind of out this way, more. Out that or less. way. Okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I mean, the, the pines are hanging in here, but it's not going to be for much longer, I don't think. Well, I can remember very clearly uh, at one stage where there was hardly any ground growth at all. It was all needles oh, from the yeah, pine trees. Right. Okay. And you look through here, it was like a shelf. The, yes. the pine trees had leaves about so high and you yeah. could see through yeah. the whole thing. And now that's, they've opened up and yes. this is really... It's really opened up, hasn't it? It's, uh... Boy, the woodpeckers have found the the dead yeah, pines. That's right. That's right. Yep. Right, and I mean, you can you can see where they are where they are petering out. I mean, this one, that one's done right there, as mm -hmm. is the next one. And um, but that's that's just as it was designed. There's a wild cherry. Yeah, right. Yep. There. Yeah, yep, that's right. So you didn't plant that. <laughs> I might have planted a few cherries, but uh, they they got in by mistake. You yeah. know, they, I didn't. Sure. I never planted a thousand wild cherry or anything yeah, no, like that. No, no, no. Maybe 25 at the most or something. Yeah. I think they came in 25 in a bundle. Okay. Like that. Well, it's it's totally possible. It just volunteered. I, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm yeah. Sure. In fact, when the forester came down and looked the place all over uh -huh. to clear cut it to go into the classified forest, uh, he he didn't spend a great deal of time here. But he said, "You're not going to make any any money off of this at all because there isn't any trees here of any value." And then when they came down and actually cut it. And they got back here on some of the background, the low ground and so on that he didn't didn't look at. They found a lot of wild cherry, oh. so we made made pretty good, pretty decent money off the uh, off the clear cut. You did, yeah. Okay, I mean there was some fairly sizable, yeah, cherry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would say that, uh, oh, besides cottonwood, the cherry was probably the dominant. Was. Uh, yeah, we didn't have okay. any. Uh, you know, we had huge red elm, yeah. But they had died already from the Dutch, Dutch elm, elm disease. disease. Yeah. So they they required you to clear cut everything. Everything. Before anything that was 24 inches chest high had to come down. Had to come down. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that and that was simply to be able to to put in the desired species for the plantation. Yeah. And then they okay. took soil samples all over the place. Sure. Okay. And then from the soil samples, they recommended the type of tree that should go into it. Okay. So it ended up red oak, tulip poplar, and some cypress. Uh-huh. Uh, and a few cherry that I stuck out around the house and so on. Uh, but it was, it was pretty much walnut and red oak and yeah. uh, no white oak. I didn't plant any white oak at all.
Right, okay. Yeah. Okay. Who's the they when they came and took the samples and when what was the date? Or who's the they? Who Oh the the forestry. The uh, state DNR. forestry department. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they're well organized. They, they've got it all pointed out for you know, and you have to abide close by it. You, you got an inspection every, I think back then it was every two years. It was every two years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the big thing that I was always cited for and needed to do more work on, was uh, the vines. I had a lot of vines yeah, growing up, okay. choking the trees and so on. Uh, grape vines or or other things too, Virginia creeper. I th I think all type of vines, yeah. uh, and I would come out in the winter time. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, they finally, I bought a little. Uh, it was an axe, and it, but it had a hose running to the somehow to the blade, oh, yeah, and okay, and there was okay. some kind of blue liquid, yeah. a container of that one on my belt, and I would take the axe and whack that vine, whether I cut it in two or not, I deposited that blue stuff on it, so it died. The nervous eye. Yeah, yeah okay. it was some something that killed trees, or, or vines, the vines, killed vines, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and that helped you to kind of get on top of it. Well, yeah, I, I kind of learned a hard lesson too. I had, I, I planted the, the circle in front of the house, all with nuts some kind of nut tree around there had quite a variety of them yeah. and weaseled in between there was a mulberry tree a couple of mulberry trees so i took my axe and boy i circled oh. that entire mulberry tree yeah. and i did it rather early in the fall i couldn't see any change in the tree at all and i thought well those mulberries you know they're hardy yeah so it seemed to me like i may have treated it two or three times and really, really yeah. chopped into it the next spring, not only did the mulberry not come out in leaves, a couple tulip poplars oh. about 25 feet away oh, uh, no. it evidently traveled through the roots. Yeah, uh, right. So the right. stuff, the stuff worked better than I, <laughs> than I thought it better would. Better than you'd hoped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, now those are tulip poplar. Yeah. And something wind bent them over. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. You can see actually where that one's kind of heaved. Yeah. Wanted to, wanted to pull out the root there. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it hit hard here. See it? it sure you can see did. right down where they're, everything's leaning over. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was the one that came down 8th Street, I think. I and, think it and, was, and yeah, and, and really, really did a number on 8th Street. In like 67? No, this was, yeah, right, more recently. This would have been in 10 or 11, 2010. Yeah, 11. I was gone already. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I, I got letters from friends back yeah, here that right. showed me yeah. what happened. That was, uh, boy, that was a big mess. There's a cherry coming up. Yeah, right, yeah. See, and that, I mean, that's part of what's exciting to me to see too, Larry, is how the secondary growth Second, is, yeah. is yeah. starting to, to catch in here. And I'm sure you didn't plant oh, yeah. these hackberries, no, for instance, no. but, but here they come too. That's a line. That's a, a marker on the survey of the farm. That tree. Oh, okay. The the, giant, the really big oak back there. Oh, yeah. yeah. That marked that yeah. corner, that particular corner. Okay. So that actually yeah. is a is on the survey map. Yeah. <laughs> I guess okay. they thought those trees would last forever. They sometimes call those witness trees. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. That's cool. That's a big one. What if we uh, up to this path and we'll circle back towards the house and then back again towards the reef center? Okay. That work all right? Sure, however you guys, however it works for you. I've got plenty of time. I've got one place I'm supposed to be in the middle of the afternoon, but I'm okay. in good shape there. <laughs> I have to go do something just from 11.30 to 12. Okay. So I could come back. If well, it's like it's like ten till eleven right now. So what if we what if we do circle back? Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. 
Let me get my paper out and see if there's anything that I thought yeah. was important today. Um, I got mine here too. A little crib sheet. Um, I, w I wanted to be sure that the uh, that we got a reminder in about crossing across there in agreement. Yeah, I appreciate <laughs> that, that was. a lot. Uh, let's see. Right, and you, yeah, you did talk about the muskrat trapping. Um, yeah. um, let's see, you, one thing you'd mentioned about was how early on when you bought the property, um, you had cattle mm -hmm. out here. And um, uh, what, uh, there was some story with with that, or or how how the cattle hadn't really been your intention. No, but but you um, you abided them for a time or something like that. Yeah, the the old farmhouse, of course, was for sale when we moved back on the river, and okay. uh, uh, my father-in-law decided that he would like to to buy that and I thought well that's a pretty good deal for the children have their grandparents close by and yeah, all okay. that kind of thing and then when he came down he said well I want I want to have the farm and uh, he, he liked horses and and wanted to have horses in the barn and so on and so I thought well it isn't going to hurt anything and it'll help keep things cleaned up but then he went from horses to cattle, and boy, the cattle and the trees that I had planted just didn't mix at all. Ah, okay. You'd already started planting. I had already started planting, and uh, they, we had a big asparagus patch on the side of the hill over there, and that worked out just fine with the trees until the trees got too big. Yeah. Then, it, But even then, they, they it survived. But he ran cattle on that, and, and boy, just in two years it was done. You yeah. know, he ate the roots and everything. So we we had a little conflict with that, and he started going to Florida in the winter time, and and I had the job of taking care of the cattle. But uh, my daughter had a horse, and my wife had a horse, so I I was taking care of things myself for yeah. myself yeah. also. Right, right. Uh, but um, I I got tired of that pretty quick, and so. Uh, one winter, the the jockey came down that bought our our steers, the the males that were yeah. born in the spring. He would come down and we'd fatten them up and and then we'd sell them. And uh, so he came down to give me a price on the steers. And uh, that particular time, instead of giving me a price like he usually did, he said, "I'll call you tomorrow." Well, then he called me back and he said, "You know," he said, "I'd like to buy." By that time, we had maybe. 12, 15 head, including the steers and, and the heifers and so on. And he said, I'd like to buy the entire herd. And I said, so. Wow. <laughs> and uh, so when my father-in-law came back, I told him that we aren't going to raise cattle anymore. We're going all the way into the trees. And by that time, he was he was older, and um, they went out to Greencroft. And it he worked was out. ready to be done with that. Too. Yeah, it, it, was, it worked out. <laughs> But there was a period of time there where we, we really were at loggerheads between the trees, and he just couldn't understand why anybody. And I tell you, the people that were really against it were the hoax. The hoax? Yeah, Beach, the son, oh. lived down here at the end of the road. And uh, Ron yeah. had okay. uh, bought our house for to have his mother-in-law in it and some things. And uh, he just, he couldn't understand why in the world we would plant trees when his ancestors worked so hard to clear this land and how hard they worked. They'd just roll over in their graves they knew I was planting all these trees and, and I didn't listen. Yeah. <laughs> so it all worked out. It's, it's just, I mean, that, that turnover is so remarkable. And so, I mean, Larry, I mean, tell me, what, what does it, what is it like for you then to walk into this woods now, 40 some years after you planted it, closing on 50, I suppose? I mean, um, what, 
how, what does it feel like? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. <laughs> to see this. I, I think, I'm, I'm 84 now, and th the greatest joys in my life have been some things that we really had to work hard, trails, mm -hmm. rails to trails, just mm -hmm. trails in town, any kind of a trail. Had a terrible time trying to get the people to see the advantage of having these things. But what a reward it is now to see that, uh, not necessarily that we were right, but at least we had a concept that's gonna survive. In yeah. the same way with the trees here. Uh, it was amazing that the, the previous owners, they were really opposed to doing this. My father-in-law was never happy that we did this. Yeah. But I always had my dad, although yeah. he, he died very young, but he was really the, the instigator. He could, he could see what this would be and what it would mean to the people and what it would mean to the city of Goshen. Yeah. You know? And uh, he wasn't a, a real tree hugger or environmentalist that yeah. was out carrying signs or anything like that. Yeah. It was just good common sense. Yeah. And he preached that to me, yeah. and so I was able to carry it on. Yeah, those two things, and, and we had a trout stream. There's a trout stream over in Middlebury that my father and I, and then my children, my boys and I, had fished for years. And he was afraid that eventually that, that it went through Amish country. And he was afraid that eventually the Amish would peter out. And then that stream, people would start building on it, and they'd dump sewage into it, and that we'd lose the only trout stream we had. And he really, really preached to Mike, my son, the dentist, and he and Jim, Jim, huh, he wrote for the United Press for the, uh, huh. and came here, came back to Goshen, retired. Jim, Jim, I can't think of his name, Walsh? So, anyways, those two put their heads together, and there's now 13 miles of that oh, that is catch and release. The, oh, only, the only catch and release stream in the state of Indiana. And, and it's that stream. And it's that stream. And the people come from all over the United sure. States to fish at because right. they know they're going to get fish. Yeah. And, you know, so th I guess those three things are the really big things that happened in my yeah. life. Yeah. And they were all things that we, uh, the, the county park board asked me to write some articles about what it was like to be on the first board that the state actually mandated park department okay. for the state of Indiana, what it was like. And, I, and the title of everything that I wrote, it was hard. Yeah. Because right, we okay. had so much, uh, oh, we don't have any money. We, uh, people don't want this. And then people didn't want things in their backyard yeah. and all of that. But it turned out, you know, look at Oxbow Park what, and Bonneville Mill Park mm. and, and all those things. So those have been very, very satisfactory okay. in, in my life and played a big, a big part. And, and therefore, it makes it easy for me now to, to hug a tree. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, right. Uh, yeah. because I I've got the the experience of something turning out really good. Yeah. And uh, and plus, I've got people like you at a young age well, that are going to perpetuate it, and it's just going to multiply more yeah. and more and more. Yeah. So, right. yeah. You, you you've you've left you've left quite an inheritance. Uh, I stopped here at this spot because this is one of the things I wanted to point out to you. I've been watching for about four years now. This is a beech tree. You're kidding me. No, nah, this is this is a beech tree, and I mean, you, you probably know that beech trees. This is a climax species. That's right. This climax species. That's right. You don't get a beech until you got a forest that is mature, <laughs> and so here it is. Well, oh, that's an answer to prayer. Isn't it is it? an answer I mean, to that, prayer. That's, that's a religious that's, tree right it there. It is. It is. This is the thing that indicates to me that what has happened here is 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 coming into full fruition. You know. Uh, man, that's exciting. It is very exciting. Oh man, I'm glad you pointed that out. <laughs> you don't know how important that is. Yeah. Gee whiz. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. Boy, I tell you, that made my day. That's. Uh, it's a it's, it's a real indication to me of of uh, your vision and your your dad's vision and uh, that's yeah. absolutely fantastic. Yeah. I, as far as I know, we never had a beech tree on the farm. Okay, right. And so you know, how did it get here? The wildlife that followed the forest that you planted. Somebody, some squirrel, I suppose, 
traveled it in here and it uh isn't that fantastic it, it found that it was the time now <laughs> uh, it's, uh, well good for you man you you yeah. know your business well we're uh, very very fortunate to have you as our forester i'll tell you uh, the, the the day the day that i uh that i first noticed it uh realized what it was i, I went i went back and i wrote about it <laughs> did you do good for you i did, I did oh yeah. wonderful that's that's fantastic <laughs> and here it is here it is <laughs> a beech tree on the Not farm tree, yeah. wow yeah that's fantastic it is it is well, that'll be going out on the emails today. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. I I, I figured that you would have oh, an appreciation I'm so glad for you what that me means. That. <laughs> I wouldn't have recognized it. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> what do we have growing here? This is a hackberry, and again, you probably didn't plant that one. I'm guessing. No, no. But um but that's that's become an impressive tree too, hasn't it? Uh, yeah, it would have been fairly good size. I should remember that one. Yeah. Cuz it certainly would have been in existence. It seems like it probably would have been. Um I don't know if maybe this is an old fence row along here. There's there's something about some of the other trees along here that make it feel that way. Some of the the mulberries. Yeah, there was a fence row in, in uh, this. So maybe um, yeah, and there's a wild cherry. Yep, I right. Yep, see that cherry, the cherry, mulberries, and then that hackberry is kind of right in that line. And so maybe they weren't real big, but um, but they were kind of hanging out in there in that in that fence row. Huh. Yeah. A beech tree. Yeah. <laughs> Golly, that's wonderful. <laughs> That's great. That is. That's an exciting, an exciting development. <laughs> of course, we've also got some tree of heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they kind of come with it. <laughs> they do. The whole thing. They eh? keep following, following along. You know, at, a t at, at the time these were planted, John Mansville had a a big shredder and after so many years they were supposed to come in and cut all the white pine down. Okay. And shred I, them up. I thought I remembered you saying something about that too. Um, so what happened? So they went out of business. Oh. <laughs> yeah, they, they made chipboard with them and then they, they it no longer existed. So we didn't have any way to market okay. the, the pine trees, the pine and, nor did I care to, oh, yeah. you know, it really yeah really was uh, something to see the pine trees that was really well, a, it it is yeah that's the old fence row okay okay the old fence row there yeah i recognize that well and i mean the pines that um i i would like to imagine that some of them will survive um i mean because there's something really remarkable about them too the ones old, on the edge yeah right yeah well, the ones on the edge yeah that's right yeah mm -hmm. Some of these right along through here are really pretty, pretty gorgeous. Yeah, there's a line that the, yeah, the electricity okay. came in on. Yeah, that's yeah, okay. I followed that fence roll. Okay, that makes sense. Hold on. Yeah. Um. A beech tree. That's really fantastic. <laughs> Gosh, that is really something. <laughs> Uh, um, uh, boy, I'm I'm glad that you appreciate that. <laughs> oh, that really means a lot, boy. That's something. So okay. that's the house. Yeah. There. All right. This would have been what we call Murray's Bend here. Okay, on the river. Here. On the river. Yeah, that right. was a good uh, because the river came down uh -huh. and made sort of an S curve. It, it dug out a hole, and that was where Pike lived in that hole. Okay. And okay. Yeah, I had a pleasant experience with that. My dad and I were out trout fishing, and and we had had a good morning. We caught some brown trout, and the uh, sun was up, and the fish had stopped hitting. And so I said, I'm going to go up this little creek. It's called Rao Eden Ditch. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go up this little creek, and, and uh, I know a spot where there's a big culvert. 
under the road, the county line road, and uh, I'm going to catch some shiners, and we'll come home and fish for pike here mm, in, on the bed. Okay, okay. Hell, we thought that was a pretty good idea, so I took off and left him where he was trout fishing, crawled out on this big cistern, and still had my waders on, and uh, I just tied on a little tiny bluegill hook, put a little piece of night crawler on it, not very big, dropped it down there, expecting to get a shiner to bite real quick. Uh -huh. And uh, the doggone thing hooked on the bottom, and it kind of provoked me, and so I decided, well, I'll have to break off to, to get out. So I just really horsed that thing, <laughs> and, and well, here you know, the stick that I was hooked on apparently started to come up. And so I thought, uh -huh. well, I'll just pull the stick out and unhook my hook. Uh -huh. Well, it wasn't long till a big tail with big orange and yellow spots on oh. it. It was a huge brown trout. <laughs> and then I got buck fever. Oh, what in the world? How was I ever going <laughs> to land it up on that cistern and all that kind of stuff? And I finally finally jumped off the cistern down into the creek. Into the creek. And I, I jumped as close as I could to the side because I didn't know exactly how deep the yeah, hole was. Yeah. And fought him and fought him and, and boy, I I really had to talk to him to get him not to go where he wanted to go, and and, uh, and finally got him out of the hole. And then it was the stream was quite shallow; it divided, and and I ran him downstream and beached him up on a, on a sandbar down there because okay. I didn't have a net big enough for him. Yeah. And you know that was the largest brown trout caught in the state of Indiana in 1962. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. I won the state award for the biggest brown <laughs> trout. And, so how big was it? Oh, it was six pounds something. We, my wife was pregnant, oh and goodness. and the baby weighed more than the trout did. <laughs> I just remember that. And, but uh, oh, you know, all the goodness. all the conservation clubs and things like that. Yeah. They uh, they wanted me to come and give a talk on how I caught that <laughs> trout. And, and oh, the exotic baits that they thought I used right. and all that kind of stuff. And, and I would have to say, no, I just caught it on a little piece of night crawler. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Caught a log. But but when I finally did land him uh -huh. and and get him out of the water, I heard people clapping and oh, and I looked okay. and here the Amish were going to church and it was on Sunday morning and, <laughs> and here they were uh, parked up there by that cistern and they were all watching me land that fish. Uh, that was quite an experience. Uh, what uh, did you get like a certificate? Or yeah, a yeah or I got a patch to put on the shoulder of my fishing vest and, and I got my picture in the paper and oh my it was uh, Claim the fame, you know, yeah, for 15 right. minutes and it's over with. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, your dad, <laughs> he was still waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, as soon as I went back to pick him up, he said, hey, he said, I've got a friend that runs a grocery store in Middlebury. And he said, we're going to go in there and weigh this because he said, I think he may have a, a record fish uh -huh. there. So we did. Turned out he was right. But I never had it stuffed or anything like that. Yeah. I kept it in my freezer for a few years, but then it got looking pretty tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, your dad grew up Amish, right? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, he was old order, raised okay. old, uh, Bond Trigger Amish. Okay. And, uh, but when he was 16, then he refused to join church. Okay. And uh, when that happened, they asked him to leave home. Yeah, I gave you the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I've read, I read a little bit in it there. I don't think his father ever meant to have him leave home and, and stay away. I think his father thought that when he got out into the English society, uh -huh. it wouldn't take him long to realize that the Amish society was better, well, yeah. and he would come back home. Hmm. Uh, but Dad was a free thinker. Yeah, yeah. And he was kind of ahead of himself. He uh, always, he seemed to be an environmentalist before that word, I even knew what it meant. Yeah, right, right. Well, he, I mean, what, you, what you've what told me about him, yeah, it makes me think that he had a, he, um, he was kind of seeing some trends 
you know, in, yeah. in our society. And, and maybe that's partly because of his Amish background that he was able to see some of that. Um, yeah, I think he became very, he, he was the youngest of, how many were there, six or seven children. And there was quite a bit of space between him and the next male. Oh, okay. And uh, so I think he had quite a bit of time alone. Uh, quite a bit of time to yeah to think and contemplate and so mm -hmm. on and huh yeah uh, i mean it's it's a it's an interesting kind of cultural interplay in this part of the world isn't it I yes mean, it's it is not necessarily unique to elkhart county there are other spots throughout the u.s but but it is a it's an interesting friday night i'm going out to a a write-in, you know, they have a, a socialistic health system, the Amish, yeah. they, they all take care of each other. Yeah. And now the operations are getting to be so expensive that even though they all get together, yeah. they can't they can't afford it. It's hard to come up with so it. So they have uh, fundraisers. And one of the things oh, that they okay. do is they have write-ins. There's some pretty nice paths from oh, Middlebury oh. up to some of the, the uh, Amish farms yeah. in LaGrange County and they'll have a what they call a write-in and then they camp out overnight huh. and have a big uh, they use these big apple butter pots yeah make stew out of them and so yeah. on uh -huh. and of course I just got to know my relatives my Amish relatives just a few you. years ago okay wow and uh, so Friday night I'm going out to to a write-in and uh, get to see my my cousins and we'll chat and talk yeah. about wild turkeys and things like that. Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. Will you stay overnight? No, no, no not this time. Not this we, time. The last one I went to, they asked me to take photographs of it because they wanted to make a calendar. Oh, yeah. Uh, and for a young fellow that was, it was uh, addicted to drugs and hmm. they were sending him down to a place to clean out and, uh, yeah. Wow. But mom and dad just didn't didn't want me to mix with them and so I never got to meet any of my relatives or anything oh, while they were no while they were alive. When they okay. when they died then a, a friend from Mississippi had sort of a similar situation with his father and uh, you'll see in the book when he yeah. he yeah. came back and asked me to come along with him to help plan a beachy reunion. And uh, oh. He wanted to make peace with his aunts, would be his father's sisters. Uh huh. And uh, it was a an interesting get together because that was the first time I'd ever been with any of my relatives. Wow. And come to find out, you know, they were just living a few miles out of Goshen. Here. <laughs> All this time. Yeah. Uh, by the way, one of the things that we did in the reunion was come down and look at the tree farm. Oh, you did? Yeah, oh, there were wow. ever so many of them that wanted to, they'd read about it in the paper. Yeah, sure. And they wanted to see the tree farm. Sure. Um, and had had never seen it before. No. Or, or, yeah, no. right. Uh, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm aware of, I'm aware of some different Amish folks. Well, there, there are, there are two Amish guys who come in here regularly to bird, um, on, on Wednesday morning. There's sort of an informal birding group that meets, that meets here. Yeah, they and are we, great birders. I understand they, are, they really are into Oh that. my goodness. They are incredible birders. They, uh, I, occasionally, very, very occasionally, I, I, you know, take a half hour to go out with them and uh -huh. kind of train my eye and ear a little bit. Uh, but man, talk about seeing the world in a different, or hearing the world in a different way. Yeah. These, those guys, they uh, they pick up stuff that I just I just never knew was there. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's a, if that's unusual among Amish, or maybe uh, you know some others who are who you are know really into that. There were so many things that when dad was a young man, uh, he had his father, the youngest 
male of the family inherits the farm. Yeah, okay. And so he was supposed to inherit the farm. That's supposed to have been your dad. Yeah. And he, the father gave everyone some livestock uh, to contribute for when they got married. But instead of giving a hog or a cow to my dad, he gave my dad a, a riding horse. Oh. And uh, riding a horse in a saddle back in those days was a pleasure that oh. Amish weren't supposed to take part in. Yeah. And uh, so he, uh, in some ways, it seems to me that he kind of helped my dad develop <laughs> his own thinking, you know. Uh, Set him on that horse. Yeah, that, that <laughs> horse played a big role in his life. <laughs> he used to race trains with it. Oh my goodness. And pe no kidding. people around there got to know Johnny Peachy because he, <laughs> yeah. he Train racer. Trains, yeah. <laughs> Boy, this is nice. Yeah. Yep. Yep. This is this is a nice trail with the uh, the story the story trail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really, really I'm proud that you guys are, like your program, you're talking about a Parkside School and, and things like yeah. that, because those are our adults coming up. Yeah, that's right. You know, yep. Things they take for granted now are going to be so important to them later on. They're right. going to be so important. And, uh, and I got to say that uh, Jeremy, our mayor, he, he has got the vision for that. And good, is, good. I'm glad to hear he that. Is, he is pushing for these kinds of things, too. Just, recognizing that we've got to find ways to inspire kids to become the adults that, that we need them to be. Yeah. Ooh, there comes the heat. Yeah, that's amazing. It is. It is that is just Well we were in Oregon and they had the most rain that they had ever received in a certain period of time. It was just a terribly hard rain. Mm. And then it got cold, and uh, it r remind me of the days when I backpacked in the mountains, and it would be so cold at night, you yeah. know, and, and yeah. you'd, you'd roll on a part of your sleeping bag that wasn't warm, and it would wake you up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so proud of Goshen. We don't have near the solar panels. I don't know a single person that has a solar panel on their roof. In Palm City, Florida. Palm City, Florida. The the electric company has made it very, very hard to put panels up, but uh, still, you know, there were a lot of incentives incentives from the federal government. Yeah. But no one took advantage of it. There just wasn't much publicity given or anything like that. That's too bad. Yeah. But boy, things are. I couldn't believe it. Driving down College Avenue, I saw all the solar panels so over there. There's panels up on yeah, the roof. That's right. Well, gee whiz. Well, this has been a real pleasure for me, you two. Yeah, th thank great. you so much, Larry. Just, yes, uh, I'm so appreciative of your time. and your Well, don't hesitate. Story. You've got my emails now. Yeah. And we'll stay in touch. We'll, uh, we'll definitely stay in I touch. I want to know how that beach tree is doing. Yeah. We'll, we'll <laughs> I can't close. tell you how happy I am to see that. It's, it's, it's just exactly like you said. That's, yeah. that's a climax species. And, Boy, we didn't have any. When I moved here, there were none, mm -hmm. and none of the whole time that I there, lived there. There are so few in town that, you know, when I, when I see them or notice them, boy, I, I mark it Latch down. Latch onto it. <laughs>